Hi folks, this is uh, Jason with uh, my dear friend Mark and we're having some uh, studies today. This is going to be uh, more of a sermon uh, from Mark on the uh, cost of true cost of discipleship and uh, Mark's going to uh, give us a sermon and then afterwards uh, I'll make some notes and uh, give a few comments of what Mark has to say. So I hope that you enjoy this, listen to it, uh, it's going to be biblical and it's going to be challenging and so let's come before the Lord, uh, get out your Bibles and get a pen and be ready to make notes because you'll really find this a help to you in your walk with the Lord. Let's come before the Lord. Father God we thank you for this day and we give you the prayers and the glory today. <clears throat> Lord we acknowledge that you are God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and these three are one and we bow before you now O God and we acknowledge Lord that you are our God and we acknowledge our need of you Father I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you would fill Mark with your Holy Spirit I pray that you would fill him afresh fill him anew and Father I pray that you would anoint him now as he preaches your word Father may those who receive your word receive it with blessing, may it be sealed to their hearts, and may they grow in the knowledge and love of you, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Over to you, bro. Okay, so this is called The Cost of True Discipleship, and we're reading from Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 26, and this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. So beginning at verse 23, Jesus says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Jesus here is speaking about the cost of true discipleship. And what he says, to summarise, our Lord Jesus is saying that true discipleship is nothing more than a complete and utter abandonment to God. And he says this abandonment is expressed by the person man or woman who denies themselves takes up their cross and follows Jesus the cost of true discipleship is absolutely everything and I believe that will only see true revival in the church when the church has true disciples when the church has true disciples who have denied themselves, who have picked up their cross daily, and who follow Jesus at all costs. True discipleship is being set apart and surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It has been holy, holy in body mind and spirit. The call of discipleship is a call to holiness. What is holiness? John Wesley summarized it as this. Biblical holiness is to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. See, what does an, an, an unholy church have to say to an unholy world? Absolutely nothing. What does an unbelieving church have to say 
to an unbelieving world. Nothing. That's why we need a standard of faith and holiness. True discipleship is a call to holiness and walked out in faith. And the revival will not come to the church until there is true discipleship and a true surrender to the Lordship of Christ within the church. What is revival? Dr. Lloyd-Jones said this. In his definition of revival, he says, A revival is an enlivening and quickening and awakening of lethargic sleeping church members. Suddenly the power of the Spirit comes upon them. They are humbled. They are convicted of sin. Then as a result of their quickening and enlivening, they begin to pray. The result of this is a large number of converted. So the two main characteristics of revival are first, this extraordinary enlivening of the members of the church, and second, the conversion of masses of people who have been outside in, in indifference and in sin. So revival begins within the heart and lives of the Christian, and then it flows out into the society. Revival not only affects the church, it affects the church, the, uh, it affects people outside the church. It affects societal structures. Another quote is, Revival awakens in our hearts an increased awareness of the presence of God, a new love for God, a new hatred for sin, and a hunger for his word. Revival is not some emotion or worked up excitement. It is rather an invasion from heaven which brings a man to a new conscious awareness of God. And God wants revival more than we do. And I'll say this, if you are a Christian and you are not praying for revival and you do not want to see revival, then you are not where God wants you to be. You can be doing everything with faith, with generosity, with compassion. But if your heart is not burning for a move of God's Spirit to change this nation, you are not in God, God's perfect will. Amen. You are not where God wants you to be. <laughs> wow. A church living in revival should be the norm, not the exception. <laughs> you see, we Amen. think revival is some exceptional Christianity. It's <laughs> not. A church in revival is the norm of Christianity. It's the expectation of Christianity. It is what the new church believed and experienced authentic Christianity to be. Oof. Amen. That revival is the norm. Are you praying for revival? Do you know what revival is? If you don't know what revival is, then read some books or ask Jason and he'll do some videos. But here's the next question. Are you a true disciple of Jesus Christ? Or are you just a churchgoer? Are you just a man pleaser? <laughs> are you a cultural Christian? Do you preach ear tickling messages? Do you love your reputation? Do you want to be seen as cool and relevant? Do you wow. <laughs> want a revival or do you want to be popular? Because you can't have both. Wow. Are you a true disciple of Jesus? If you are a true disciple of Jesus, then your life 
will be marked by what God says through his son Jesus Christ in verse 23. You will be denying yourself, picking up your cross daily and following Jesus. Many people say, I want to live for Jesus. You hear them singing it. I want to live for Jesus. But brothers and sisters, how many say that they want to die for Jesus? <laughs> when wow. Jesus said these words, brothers and sisters, this is an urgency. The people who heard him in the context would have been thinking about a literal death, not just a spiritual one, a literal physical death. This is why the crowds left him. And this is radical and it might scare you and it scares me, but I'll tell you this. Jesus Christ expected a literal death as a sign of authentic discipleship. Oof. And Jesus confirms this because he tells Peter in the Gospel of John that he's going to die. He says to Peter, he says, when you were a little boy, a child, Someone would lead you where they wanted you to go. But then he says to him, but you'll be led to a place. You'll be led to that place where you will have to be challenged on the true cost of discipleship. When he was talking about death, he told Peter he was going to die. Matt in, in a, an awful death. Now I'm not saying that should be a, a wish because nobody really should be persecuted. John 21 18 says it like this. This is Jesus speaking to Peter. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. <coughs> this he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 2, Jesus tells the church of Smyrna, he tells them, he says, Be faithful unto death in order that you may receive the crown of life. What a demand. What a challenge. You know, the early church considered it an honour to die for Jesus Christ. It was part of the package of discipleship. And in some countries today, it's still the same. Ignatius of Antioch sent a letter to the Romans. And he was talking about um, the possibility of him being martyred. And he said this. I write to the churches and impress on them all that I shall willingly die for God unless you hinder me. I beg you not to stop me. Let me to become food for the wild beasts. I am the wheat of God and let me be the ground by the teeth of the wild beasts that I may be found the pure bread of Christ. May I enjoy the wild beasts that are prepared for me. And I pray that they may be found eager to rush upon me, if they be unwilling to assail me. I will compel them to do so. Polygarp said this before the council. It says, but again, the proconsul said to him, Polygarp, I will cause you, Polygarp, thee, to be consumed by fire, if thou will not repent and deny Jesus. But Polygarp said, You threaten me with fire, which burns for an hour. 
and after a little while is extinguished. But you are ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Bring forth what you will. While he spoke these and many other things, he was filled with confidence and joy, and his countenance was full of grace, and the proconsul was astonished. Immediately then they surrounded him with those substances which had been prepared for the funeral pile. But when they were about also to fix him with nails, he said, Leave me as I am, for he that given me strength to endure the fire will also enable me, without you securing me by nails, to remain without moving in the pile. Do these accounts move you? They should or there's something wrong with us. We're spiritually dead. You know, we mourn about getting out of the bed if we have the flu. We mourn about trivial things. Are we denying ourselves? You know, the church has become obsessed with self-image and serving self instead of dying to self. Christian books, the ones that sell, have titles like Your Best Life Now, Become a Better You, Eight Steps to Create the Life You Want. Christians are more concerned with, concerned with feeling good rather than saving people from sin and from hell. John Hagee summarizes it up like this. The Great Commission has become a side issue within the church. We are infatuated with what God can do for us rather than what God can do through us. The church is obsessed with comfort, carnality and compromise. We have ritual without righteousness. We have height without holiness. We have shout without substance. We have a feel-good theology that has produced hot tub Christianity. Hot tub Christianity is soothing. It's sensual. It's relaxing. It's laid back. It makes no demands. It dodges the tough issues. It never takes a stand for anything, but sees a nation racing towards the gates of hell and says nothing. There was a story of a woman who went to see her pastor. And then she says, Pastor, I've got a terrible self-image. And the pastor says, that's your problem. And she says, well, what, what, what do you mean, pastor, that's my problem? What kind of an answer is that? Are, aren't, you supposed to, aren't you supposed to counsel me? Aren't you supposed to help me? <coughs> what do you mean? And the pastor said to her, you show me in the Gospels and in the New Testament and in the whole Bible where it says anything about having a good self-image. And then he says, dead people do not have image problems. They're dead. You can go and point a gun at someone in a coffin and they won't move. They're dead. Are we dead to the world? Or are we, as Leonard Ravenel said, fascinated by it? Luke 9, 57, 62, there's an interesting conversation. Again, Jesus expands on the cost of discipleship. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus says to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell, go out of my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand 
to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. The key word in this is the three people said, let me first. One was obsessed with property. A second was obsessed with money. The third was obsessed with relationships. Anything that takes priority over following Christ has to go. Has to go. Maybe we say the same thing. Let me first. Let me first pull an end to this relationship. Let me first see if this job comes through. Let me first complete this project. But Jesus says, no. Whoever puts his hand to the plough and look, looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Are you fit for the kingdom of God or are you unfit? That's the question we ask ourselves. Self-image and self-focus according to the Bible is a sin. 1 John 3, 4 says sin is lawlessness. The Greek for lawlessness there is anomia. And it means the rejection of the law or will of God and the substitution of the will of self. The refusal to deny ourselves and our sin is to reject the will of God. <coughs> it is to live as if there is no God or accountability. In fact, it is an attack on the counter of God himself. It's attacking God because we are saying that serving ourselves is what will bring us fulfillment. And it is saying that God is a liar. Jesus warns in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, you who practice sin. Sin is deadly. Sin is putting yourself first. Sin is acting and living like there is no God. Sin is thinking you know best. Thomas Guthrie put it like this. Who is the painted temptress that steals our virtue? Who is the murderess that destroys our life? Who is this sorceress that first deceives and then damns our souls? It is sin. Who with icy breath blights the fair blossoms of youth? Who breaks the hearts of parents? Who brings old men grey hairs with sorrow to the grave? Sin. Who changes gentle children into snakes, tender mothers into monsters and their fathers into worse than herods? Sin. Who casts the apple of discord on household hearts? Who lights the torch of war and bears it blazing over trembling lands? Who smiles to deceive, sings to lure, kisses to betray and flings her arm around our neck to leap with us into petition? Sin. Who turns the soft and gentlest heart to stone? Who hurls reason from her lofty throne and impels sinners mad as a gathering swine down into the lake of fire? Sin. Denying ourselves is making sure God is number one and getting all sin and all ignorance out of our life that would stop us from following Christ. Folks, you don't need a self-consciousness. You need a God-consciousness. A God-consciousness. So the cost of true discipleship, according to Jesus in verse 23 of Luke chapter 9, is... First of all, deny yourself. The second is, take up his cross daily. You know, crosses speak of death. If you are in bondage to sin, or do not want to stop your sin, it's simply because you are not dead to yourself. You've not 
come truly to the end of yourself. The cross of Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God's hatred for sin and his love for humanity. The cross reveals what God hates, sin, and what God loves, you. We have to pick up our crosses daily and follow Jesus. When we pick up our cross daily to follow Jesus, we experience the love of God and more of its fullness. There's two dangers. There's two dangers. The lack of the fear of God. The lack of the fear of God. You see, the fear of God leads to repentance. The fear of God keeps us from sinning willfully. Teresa of Avila said this. She says one day she was looking at a picture of Christ crucified and she says she felt overwhelmed by the love of God and she felt changed inside. She felt loved. And you're experiencing the love of God the love of God is something that heals us. It's just something that it heals our broken hearts, heals our memories. It heals us of fear. The psalmist says, your love, Lord, is better than life. Experiencing the love of God is receiving total forgiveness total forgiveness. Christ offers us total forgiveness. All your sins that you've ever committed wiped out. That total forgiveness heals our hearts. When we experience God's forgiveness, we don't care what others think about us. It's irrelevant. The cost of true discipleship is denying self, picking up our cross, and following Jesus. You know, following Jesus is a journey. It's a long-term process. Jesus is not interested <coughs> in half-hearted emotional conversions. You know, Jesus mentioned to people about counting the cost. When Jesus talked about disciples, many people walked away and left him. Peter once says, this is a hard teaching, Lord. Who can accept it? And Jesus said to him, do you also want to go, Peter? And Peter said to Jesus, where would we go, Lord? For you have the words of eternal life. There is nowhere else to go. If you don't follow Jesus, there is nowhere else to go for eternal life. There's nowhere else to go for forgiveness. There's nowhere else to go for love and grace. You can never be holy without following Jesus. Mm. You can't clean your sin away. You can't clean yourself up. You can't put on new clothes. Jesus talked about a man building a tower. He says, a man doesn't build a tower without counting the cost. You know, it's not about signing a card and saying a five-minute prayer. It's about committing ourselves wholeheartedly to Jesus. We need to be obsessed with the love of Jesus with Christ, with following him. We need to experience the presence of God. God's omnipresence is described in Psalm 1397. That means he's everywhere. The psalm says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. Jesus taught about manifesting his presence in John 14, 21. He said this, 
Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and manifest myself to them. The Greek word for manifest in that context is P-H-A-N-E-R-O-O. And it's fan, faniru or panru. And it gives the meaning of bringing the unseen to be seen, the unheard to be heard, and the unknown to be known. Moses complained to God in Exodus, and he said, If your presence does not go with us in the promised land, do not bring us up from here. Moses was saying, God, if your presence is not with me, I would rather die. Moses had been promised by God for years that they would, he would lead the Israelites into the promised land. But what Moses was saying here, he's saying, God, I'm more interested in the presence than the promise. If you, your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. <coughs> Prosperity and worthy success is meaningless without the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. We will never be satisfied without the presence of God. Mm. Amen. And in revival, the presence of God is manifest. Mm. We have to make a choice. We have to want the presence of God more than anything else. Psalm 16, 11 says, In your presence is fullness of joy. Do you want fullness of joy? You need the presence of God. Moses says in Exodus 33, 16, he said the uniqueness of him and the nation of Israel was that the manifest presence of God among them set them apart from everybody else on earth, all the nations. That was the uniqueness. They had God's presence guiding them, leading them, shepherding them, watching them. The uniqueness of our faith is the Holy Spirit, God, lives in us. The good news is in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit, it was only with people for a certain task, the Holy Spirit would come down and anoint Moses and Joshua and Samuel and David. It would anoint them for particular tasks God had commanded them to do and to appoint them to do. He came and went. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, people had to go to the temple or the tabernacle to experience the presence of God. But you know, God has poured Himself out into our hearts and into our own minds. God is with us and in us now. You know, if we do not walk in the power of the Holy Spirit outside the church, we will never experience it in the church. We cannot live ungodly lives and expect God to show up. That is religion, not faith. We need more of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. It will only come when we are a people of prayer. John Wesley knew about the presence of God. We're not talking theory, we're talking experience. We're talking, uh, we are talking about a feeling of the love of God. We know we're loved by God. The scripture says it, but do you feel loved by God? Do you feel loved by God? John Wesley said this, he was at a prayer meeting. He says, about three in the morning, as we were continuing in prayer, the power of God came mightily upon us, that many cried out for exceeding joy, and many fell to the ground. As soon as we had recovered, we broke out with one voice. We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. No revival or true discipleship can be established without a strong life of prayer. 
In revival, the presence of God comes with power. John Wesley preached in the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> this is an account of what happened under the ministry of John Wesley when he moved in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, some of them dropped down as dead, having no strength nor appearance of life in them. Some burst into strong cries and tears. Some exceedingly tremble and quake. Others began to sweat or struggled as if in the agonies of death so that strong men might be needed to keep people from hurting themselves. Sometimes Wesley had to stop preaching and pray. Many of the afflicted persons would suddenly cease their struggles and begin to praise God. Others would continue days or weeks in heaviness. They spent days and weeks feeling drunk in the Holy Spirit, feeling the joy of the Holy Spirit, feeling like they were experiencing days of heaven upon earth. <coughs> Smith Wigglesworth was walking through a train station and a Catholic priest, priest fell on his knees. He was convicted of sin. Charles Finney went into a factory and they asked him to preach and he preached and 3,000 people came to the Lord. The cost of true discipleship is everything but the reward of true discipleship is eternity. Now who in the right mind, says Max Licardo, would swap a 70 year life of everything you wanted for an eternity of eternal joy. If you had a choice, would you swap a 70 year life of everything you've, your heart's desired, only to end up in eternal hell with raging fire without God? Who would swap, who would make that bargain? Would we swap 70 years of a life of everything we wanted, all the money we wanted, all the indulgence we wanted, all the material wealth we wanted, only to end up, end up without Christ and without God? without our sins forgiven. No one in their rational mind would make such a bargain. Jesus said himself in Luke 9, 25, what profit is it to a man if he wins the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? The way is narrow, not wide. Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 13 to 14, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many mm. who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. We were saying that we'll only experience the full manifest presence of God and revival in the church when we live a true life of discipleship to Jesus Christ. When we deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow Jesus no matter what the cost. No matter what the cost. There is a cost to following Jesus. So to conclude, are we going to commit ourselves to true discipleship? Are we going to play church games? Are we going to be play power games? Are we going to love ourselves, love our reputations? Or are we going to love Christ? Let's pray, and then we'll go over to Jason. Father God, thank you for your challenging, strong words, Lord, to myself. Mm -hmm. I'm preaching to myself, Lord. And um, scary words, Lord Jesus, frightening words. Too much for me, I can, I, I'll be honest, Lord, they are too much for me to take sometimes when we know the literal meaning. Lord, help us to deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow you. It's hard, Lord, and we can't do it. 
without encouragement, without brotherhood, and without the presence of your Holy Spirit. Mm. We desire to follow you, Jesus. Help us, we pray, God. We want to be well-pleasing to you, Father. We want to be alert and awake, Father. We don't want to be like the foolish virgins, Lord. But we want to be ready when you come, Lord. We want to be prepared. Forgive us our apathy and laziness, Lord. Forgive us for our lack of love. And I pray for the church, Lord. I pray for the persecuted church, Lord. Mm. I pray that you would release them, Father, from persecution. No one should have to suffer, Lord, in a day like this. Mm. We're not asking for that, Lord. We're asking that these Christians would be free to serve you, Lord. It says in your prophetic books, Lord, let us worship you without fear. Without fear, Lord, to worship you. And that's what our prayer is, God. I pray for the persecuted church. I pray that you would make it so so we can serve you without fear, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Over to you, bro. Okay. That's amazing, mate. I, it's an impertinence to talk after that. Um, I just really, I'm really encouraged and really challenged by that. Uh, I don't know about everybody else who hears this. Uh, there's been somebody listening, and I'm sure there'll be many others listening in the future. That what was said there was really challenging. Um, I I just need to relieve myself just for one second, Mark, and uh, I just want to get a magazine. So can I give it back to you just for a minute, or do yeah. you want to just, or we can have a break for a minute, and it's up to you. Uh, but I'll hand over to you if, if you just want to be quiet or you want to say something. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'll just be one a couple of minutes. All right. Okay. Hey there, Mark. Yeah, there, Jeff. Uh, I, first thing I want to say is uh, a couple of things, really. I think uh, that kind of preaching that that you, you was preaching, you don't hear today, uh, and it's biblical and it's absolutely needed, and you should be encouraged. And people out there, if you can pray for Mark, uh, he's, he's waiting for a call. Uh, to a particular uh, group of churches and uh, you know pray that that God would open the door for him uh, that he can minister in preaching because I'm sure you all agree that that's what he should be doing <coughs> that he was that he's uh, called to do that and so I'll be encouraged Mark that you've got the gift of preaching and teaching and that message was just absolutely wonderful <coughs> Um, there's so much in what you said uh, to talk about um, <coughs> I've, I've just made a load of notes um, mm. I'll just uh, 
I just thought that I, I thought it was interesting when you said the church is obsessed with self-image. Yeah. You know, I thought that was really profound and interesting. Um, uh, and also, we can be obsessed with our own self-image as Christians. Yeah. And uh, and I thought why your sermon was just an axe to the root of all that and. And you, I'm sure you sell, yourself you've read loads of books. I've read quite a few books on church growth and all these different ideas about how the church should be. And I, I just thought it was so radical what you were saying because if what you're saying is true, and I believe it's true 100%, what, you, what your sermon did is go right to the root cause of the problem in church life. And church churches are trying to reach out, and they're trying to be culturally relevant, uh, like have different kinds of uh, church, uh, you know, cafe church and all the rest of it. But what you're saying here is the problem's deeper than that. You know, that's just the that's just the periphery. The the problem is at the heart of things. That it's all about in the end of the day. It's all about self. And if we're going to be a disciple, it's about dying to self. It's about being crucified. So that's what I uh, one of the things I got. I don't know what you think about that, but that that's yeah. that's what I got from what you were saying. And uh, just everywhere you look in America, there's a lot of self. It's all about self-image. A lot of it with these massive TV evangelists. Uh, and all these different conferences and how the church should grow. The church is full of self-image in the UK where it's always worried about how it's viewed by the secular culture, not wanting to upset the secular culture. But this is about radical being obsessed with Christ and, and being uh, passionate about him and laying everything for him. And I just thought, that your message is really prophetic. So I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that or say anything or. Um, no, I think that's about. I think that's about it, Jay. But um, sometimes, and this sounds up, but I, I, I think sometimes I'm in the wrong generation. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm moved by these 17th century revival preachers, 18th century. Yeah, yeah. You know, I find comfort reading Wesley and Spurgeon and Bishop Ryle and yeah. You know, yeah. I, I sometimes I, I I feel I don't fit. Yeah. In contemporary Christianity, to be honest, <laughs> I think I'm definitely in the wrong age. Yeah. And I, I long I long for an old expression of Christianity. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's it's um. And yeah, I think I think for those who are like Mark and myself, you know, not to be discouraged, uh, because as Mark was pointing out, I was trying to get the door, Jay. Yeah, as Mark was pointing out, if we want to see God at work in revival, then the answer is that we've got to seek God in prayer. And if we seek God in prayer, if we if we lay hold of God in prayer, then God will hear us. We think of that text in the Old Testament. You know, if people, if my people humble themselves, you know, and if we humble ourselves and we pray and keep pleading with God, then God will hear our prayers. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit will begin to move. But I definitely... I, I just one hundred percent agree with you. Really, ultimately, um, the church is in is is playing in shallow waters when there's oceans of God out there to know, and that God's got far more than we could ever dream, and and we need to press into God and seek Him more, and pray that He would come and work. And I think it was perceptive what you said about. If you're not desiring revival, then it shows where you're at, really, because you're not really desiring the glory of God. 
you're not and and God's glory is being mocked because yeah. of the weakness of the church and you should be desiring the glory of God uh, for and to see revival and the other thing you said was that revival is not unusual it should be the norm yeah and and I thought that was amazing because um, it, it shows you where we're at really it mm. shows you that discipleship is it a low ebb? Because really, uh, if there were true disciples around, then we would be in revival mode. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think. Um, I think there's a, a couple of things. That's important, though. I think um, just to counterbalance what you're saying, because I, 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 I 100% agree with what you're saying. Yeah. And I believe, I, to me, it's just prophetic, absolutely prophetic, and absolutely needed. The one of the problems can be, I think, is I think there can be a danger on both sides. I think you can obsess to the point of wanting revival and praying and praying to the point where you can miss what God's already doing yeah that God yeah. is is doing and not all people but some people can be seeking revival uh, I'm not saying you at all I don't believe you at all but some people can seek revival and in a way it's more about um, a romanticism of the past, yeah, uh, yeah. and and um, there's a romanticism of the past, and also uh, an un an unwitting ego egoism where they want to see God at work, but they want to be at the centre of it. <laughs> so there can be even dangers in that, but I think that ultimately what you're getting at is it's about a passion for God it's a passion for laying down your life and, and for being real with God um, so that saves the safeguards against that but I think that those are some of the dangers um, and I think also um, to remember that God is converting people today even though there isn't revival as we'd like it yeah um, the, other, the other thing as well is what you're saying is a shake-up uh, you know a lot of what you're saying is a shake-up I just want to read this uh, I think it's in here uh, what I'm about to read read people is going to be absolutely shocking so I mean if you don't want to listen now I think you should go away because when you say hello to Jason hi Jeff. hi Claire hi, you're right. coming but what I'm going to read now, make sure there's no children around anyone, because this is really, this is terrible what I'm going to read you. Um, but it highlights what Mark's saying about suffering for the gospel, being a disciple, and that in the in the early church, you know, it was seen as, as a de literal death. That if you're going to really pick up your cross, they really believed that they would they would lose their lives. And Mark mentioned a couple of the martyrs. So here here's a this is some the kind of things that are happening to Christians around the world. And now what I'm going to read you is absolutely terrible. This is in a uh, a legitimate Christian magazine called Barnabas A, July to August 2014. It says. Pakistan Sarah Iqbal, a seven-year-old Christian girl. Are you ready for it? This is absolutely terrible. Sarah Iqbal, a seven-year-old Christian girl, was gang-raped by four Muslim men in Silicon District, Punjab Province, Pakistan, on 23rd of April. She was taken into intensive care where her condition was stabilized. The gang also kidnapped her father, Ibn al-Masih, to try to force him to reach an agreement with his daughter's rapist 
He was freed by police after two days in captivity. The police seemed reluctant to take action against the perpetrators, but following repeated repeals, appeals and pressure from the Christian community and human rights organization, an investigation was launched and at least one suspect has been arrested. Christians have held torchlight procession and prayers and have called for justice for, for uh, Sierra, S-A-I-R-A. -A. Well, what I'm saying is, is um, there are Christians around the world today who are going through horrendous suffering for naming the name of Christ. And we as Christians in the UK and in America and in Europe, we moan and we, we, we moan about maybe some people aren't coming into the church as they used to be. We moan because maybe you're at work and someone frowns at you as a Christian. And you moan. What's wrong with us? Where's the iron in our soul? Where's the passion? Where's the vision? When our fellow brothers and sisters around the world are dying for the faith, and being snatched and attacked and raped and uh, and all the rest of it, and we moan. And Mark's call is to is to book up and name the name of Christ, and let's get real with Christ, and let's get out there for Jesus, and serve the Lord, and die to self, and um, and be on fire for God. Um. And I've just been really encouraged by what, what Mark said today. It's really challenged me. And it makes me realize that what I'm hearing today is is not the true call. It's not it's not got that clarion call that Mark's message had to call us to serve Christ and follow him as we should. Um any thoughts about what I've said, Mark, or Yeah, I think it's. Um, I think it was good what you said about not sort of. Sometimes it can be if people are frustrated in the presence with Christianity. Yeah. They can sort of look back to bygone days. Yeah. And it's almost like. Uh, what's the word? Uh, nostalgia. Nostalgia. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's just, um, I think the message I was bringing, yeah. I, I think, you see, I think there's this difference between leaders, Christian leaders and Christians, mm. and I think that's more of a message to Christian leaders mm. rather than... Um, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be, but, you know, the state of the church, everything rises and falls on leadership, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So the state of the church really is a reflection of the leadership, Yeah. I think. So you can't, I'm, I, I wouldn't necessarily preach that to, like, um, you know, just have every day, maybe it's Christians, you know. Yeah. Because, but I definitely think it's a message for leadership. Yeah. That's what that is. It's a message for leadership. Yeah. I, I, and um, what 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 burdens me is leaders don't seem to like those messages. I mean, you expect leaders to be able to handle stuff like that, you know. Mm. So that's I, I wouldn't want people. I, w I wouldn't want people to be burdened by it. But I would want Christian leaders to really take it seriously. Well, I would. Then, I, sorry, mate. Go on. No, that's it. I would have to disagree with you. I think your message is a prophetic call to the church as a, a, a large as well. You know, I think the church needs to hear it as a church. <coughs> Personally, that's what I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think your message is for leaders, but it, it's also a clarion call to 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 churches, uh, uh, you know, in the West, to to 
to listen to what you what God is saying there. Um, I've got a couple more things, but I'll just read one or two of these things because some of your stuff was about persecution and willing to follow Christ. Um, in Somalia, a mother of two and a cousin have been publicly killed in Somalia after Al Shabaab militants found out they were Christians. Saidia Ala Omar, 41, Ozama Mahoud Magu, 35, were beheaded in Bara in the lower Shabali region on the 4th of March. In Libya, 10 Egyptian Christians were killed in Libya in just over a month in what is to be a, to be a, con, to be a concerted campaign to wipe them out of the country. In Uganda, a young Ugandan woman has been beaten to death by a Muslim father after he found that she had, and her sister had converted to Christianity. Tanzania, a proposed new three-tier political system that would... Um, give greater power to Zanzibar's government has raised concerns about the future of Christians in the Muslim majority archipelago. Egypt four people were killed in an, is in an Islamist attack on a church in Egypt on the 28th of March supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood shot at the church building in Ain Shams a suburb of Cairo and set carts uh, set cars parked by it on fire. A young Christian woman, Mary Summer George, was among those killed. She was in a car outside the church and was targeted by the Islamists. Islamists. They were spotted across uh, a cross hanging from the rear view mirror. An eyewitness said that Mary was savagely attacked by the Muslim mob. So that's what's happening around the world today to Christians who are naming the name of Christ and and we get obsessed with our self-image, we get obsessed with the self-image of the church and we just need to listen to what Mark was saying and get real with God and press into God, draw close to God and pick up our cross and follow him. Hmm. I think I like to say this as well, Jay. Yeah. Like if anyone listen, listen to that message, I wouldn't want people to think what is it? I wouldn't want people to think I'm encouraging people to be to be, have a martyr complex or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Or um, you know, or I've got a martyr complex. It's it's not that at all because I, I don't think in a day like this, twenty twenty first century, yeah, people should be having to lay down their lives like that. I, I don't, you know, mm. it's it, Jesus has done it so to free the world, but as People might be asking, well, how can I put that into practice practically here and that? And I would just encourage people to maybe, if they want to respond to that message and they don't know how to, maybe they can set a prayer group up and start praying for the persecuted church. Yeah, yeah. Or spend some time praying for the persecuted church or look at Barnabas. So if people want to respond, you know, yeah, yeah. it could be God's calling people to, to pray for the persecuted church. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just want to make I don't I don't want it to sound um, I know you know saying. yeah you don't want, I know I understand. You yeah. don't you don't want that. we're not we're not calling you all to be martyrs. <laughs> but uh, it's www.barnabasfund.org if you want to support <coughs> the group they'll send you uh, leaflets and literature to help you start a prayer group for the persecuted church www.barnabasfund.org Yeah, no, I agree with you. We're not, we're not to go out to seek martyrdom or anything like that. And uh, the the thing is, is that I just I, I think that we have to from from the message that I got from you is that we have to count the cost of who who are we who are we living for. Are we living for ourselves or are we living for Christ? And if we live for Christ, then it means we live, we give him everything. And if it means we give him everything, then we must be willing to hand over our lives to him. And now for some of us, it might be that he wants us to serve the Lord in the West and, and do whatever. But a few might be sent to different countries 
But the thing is, is are you willing to count the cost and be a full disciple of Christ and give your life to Christ and allow him to use you as he see fit? And that's the cost. And there's a great blessing in it because if you hand over your life to him, he'll do amazing things in your life. He'll, he'll, he'll use you in ways that you never dreamed. But there also is a great cost in that, that sometimes it will be a difficult road. But you'll never know if you're only half-hearted, if you're only playing at Christianity. If, as Mark said about these disciples who were obsessed with property, if they were obsessed with money and they were obsessed with relationships, if you're obsessed with your relationships and money and property, then are you open to hear the call of God? But if you drop being obsessed with these things and get obsessed with Christ, then you'll hear what Christ wants for you in your life. Um, I think just two other things that I want to say. and um, Bonhoeffer wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And he wrote a book, and some of the things that you've said in your sermon, he said. But I, I just wanted to draw a parallel today, because I think what you're saying is all is very prophetic. Um, a number of Christian leaders in America, I, I'll do the historical bit and then I'll shut up. But in, in, in the time of the Second World War, just before the Second World War, um, the German church was being taken over by the Nazis. And Bonhoeffer was concerned that Lutheran Christians were not being true disciples and standing up against this this encroachment on the church. So he wrote the book Cost of Discipleship to get them to be loyal to Christ and to follow him. And as he wrote that book, it was prophetic because the church came under massive pressure and many of the church leaders were, the, were arrested. Now in our present time, in America, Paul Washer, Steve Lawson and a number of other Christian leaders have stated that there's going to be a coming persecution uh, in America. And I think, you know, if persecution comes in America and if it comes in the West, then we have to be ready now to be true disciples. If we're not true disciples now, if we're not willing to stand for Jesus now, and get strong in God now and be willing to die to self now when the persecution comes if it comes how are we going to stand if we're just playing at Christianity now um, and and it's not that important to us then when persecution comes we're just going to fall away and so I think Mark's challenge is for us to be to also prepare is a preparation for the future that things will perhaps get more uh, difficult for Christianity in the West um, and I think we need to take that on board I don't know what you think Mark but that's just a thought and then I've got one thing after that any thought there mate? No I agree Jay. totally agree uh, so have you got any books to recommend to read or anything or I've got a couple of books that I can recommend to read. Uh, if anybody wants to do some study or uh, or any uh, resources that they can go and listen to or look at, any any sermons, any or scriptures that you think they can study on. There's a a sermon series by John MacArthur called Hard to Believe on his <laughs> website Grace to You, which is good. Okay. Hard to believe. Yeah. <coughs> There's a book by Colin Urquhart called Revival Fire. Mm. That's a good. That's a good book. Revival Fire. Um. I I'll have a little thing, Jay. Come back to me. All right. I've got. Uh, I've just got a couple. I would recommend Bonhoeffer's book. True Disciple, the Cost of True Discipleship. It's an excellent book. Um, and 
I would encourage you to read Thomas Kempis Imitations of Christ the first uh, half of the book Thomas Kempis and uh, also if you wanna start listening to the Lord Jesus and, and listen to what he has to teach and to say I would say get hold of JC Ryle's commentaries on Matthew, Mark, Luke and John published by the Banner of Truth uh, JC Ryle's commentaries on Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and um, if, even if you're a young Christian they're very easy to read and just read a little section uh, each day and that will help you in your discipleship learning to listen to what the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching you each day that's JC Ryle um, Bishop JC Ryle and that's uh, his commentaries on Matthew, Mark, Luke and John published by the Banner of Truth they're very cheap the classics and they'll do you a power of good yeah can I remember I, I recommend anything by um, any books by Leonard Ravenhill yeah any sermons by him anything by Toza what is it, is it, is it A.W. Toza yeah 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 anything by A.W. Toza He's got a book called The Crucified Life. Also, if people go to YouTube, there's a, a sermon jam by David Wilkinson called A Call to Anguish. Or there's a full sermon called A Call to Anguish that you can find on Sermon Index or it's, it's on the internet. Amen. So that, that's, that's some um, good stuff out there. And there's also a website and YouTube channel called Sermon Index and there you'll find some uh, old classic sermons and also some modern preachers that uh, are on the same page as Mark uh, and you'll get some more teaching on this kind of stuff okay and and David Pawson as well David dot org okay da David David Pawson okay you have some resources that are really good Oh. Anything from him. Okay, that sermon index and then David Pawson. Okay, mate. So I'm closing prayer. Yeah. And uh, thanks, Mark, for that. That was, well, it was just really encouraging, mate, and challenging. Um, okay, we'll close. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, the message that we've heard today, we, we just pray that you'd help us to apply it to our lives. That it wouldn't just be words, that it wouldn't just be rhetoric, but it would permeate deep into all our hearts. That, Father, we'd meditate on this message that Mark gave us, or that you gave him to give us, Lord. And I pray that as we go into meditating upon you and meditating on this message, Father, I pray that you would strengthen us and help us and bless us, Lord. And so, God, we pray that you be with each one of us now in your name and for your glory. Amen. 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 Thanks, Mark. Um, stay around, folks. There'll be more on today. Um, Mark, do you, do you feel like doing your next one? or? Yeah, I'll do my next one. I'll have a cup of tea first, Jay. Okay, little... we're going to... So about we'll... 15 minutes. About 15 minutes. Another thing is, uh, you know the doctrine of hell? Oh, yeah. When you've done your anger, is it possible to, to do just finish that off? Yeah. Just tell Can us. Do, yeah. If you could tell us what you've read, and um, in the 15-minute break, I'll just read uh, something that I can put into that. All right. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to do in 15 minutes. We're going to we're just having a break. Then we're going to come back, and Mark's going to do uh, a study on anger, and we can I can chip in a little bit, I think, on on the discussion there uh, in a discussion and Bible study. And then after that, we're just going to round it off with another Google Hangout on hell, and just finish our final thoughts on the teaching of hell. So. Uh, come back in 15 minutes, get yourself a cup of tea. It's been good to be with you all, and uh, see you in 15 minutes. Thank you. God bless. <laughs>